guess I needed some time to get away. I needed some peace of mind, some peace of mind out of stay. So I found it all out of human attraction. Maybe a greyhound could have been my way. Cause you want a million. Yeah, you wanted a million, baby. You're a shooting star. Live with something we'll see you all oh, before you make us cry. No, we tried to reach a steady casual, but you were much too high. Yeah, she, she, you were much too high. Much, much too high. I'm done with this song. Thank you. Thank you guys for noticing. Living Dreams. Why was Stevie casual in California? And I came out here to live my dreams. My birth name is Stephen Jeffrey Bryant. And I'm the son of a naval aviator. And I was born in Pensacola Naval Air Station. And then I went to Virginia Beach, Virginia. Monterey, California. Providence, Rhode Island. Jacksonville, Florida. Then I went to Washington, D.C. Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. And then I went back to Washington, D.C. Now I'm 12 years old. I felt like I was 10,000. For that 12 years, rock and roll. I was born in 1967, same month and year that the Doors put out their first album. Music to me was like white light, and you had lyrics that would just make you alive. And my father being in the military during the Vietnam War, we're talking about the 70s, America was in almost a cultural revolution. Rock and roll was something that was beyond the government. So I started playing guitar, and I had the privilege of playing every, you know, two years of high school. By the time I, I graduated, I decided that there's not going to be a shoulda, coulda, woulda moment in my life, that I'm going to live my dreams. So I had this vision, and I'm in Northern Virginia, in my mother's basement. I'm like, I'm going. I'm going to L.A. And I drove out here. It's June 1987. I'm 20 years old. I'm living at the Rose Building. It was like a two-story building, and the part they allowed us to live was in the second story. And you'd walk up the staircase, and we had Chuck Skull and, and Jay Bright, and they had this security company called Sudden Death. You know, people were just like being just off the wall. And so, yeah, I'm starting to partake in the only nightlife there is, which is Al's Bar. And I meet Don Jones. The man's like five foot five, 55 year old. And some dash and daring definitely swaps with Mellow Cool. This man was loved and liked, and there was authenticity about Don Jones that he had all the keys to the kingdom. So Don became a really good friend. Don comes up to me. He goes, hey man, let's go to Mexico. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, let's do it. And I'm 20 years old, I have no luggage. Now Don Jones is Amtrak, so he's got two weeks off. So we're going to take Amtrak to the border. We're on the way to Rosarito, because there's a man named Raul, and we're going to go visit his mother. I was off the ocean in his trailer park. So here we are, you know, it's paradise. I mean, we're talking about Pacific Ocean and like a lagoon. And we start drinking. We drink when we wake up. A carta blanca. And we get back up to LA. And my roommate, he moved all my belongings out. He just felt that that was, it was inappropriate time of my life. I'd sit there and just take a week or two weeks. I don't know how long it was. It was at least five days. But then Don reached out. He had th three rooms up here in the American Hotel. So, Don had me live in his, his room. I was working in the film industry, and it's kind of like a darling job. And he was proud like a father. You know, he knew I was going to make it. When I showed up, I was like six months into my 2-0 being 20. Don gave me a, a key to the front door to the American. Now, the American, you could walk up the staircase and go to the bathroom to the left, all the way at the end of the hall. Go into the bathroom. You could open up the window, and lo and behold, the Al's bar had a patio. So I would jump through the window and then I would dangle down on the, on the wall of the patio and I let go. And lo and behold, the man who is not Al, but Mark Kreisel, caught me first time 86. You're out of here. I obviously, I became 21. And so then I could walk through the front door. But the entrance to Al's bar, it wasn't West Coast, it was East Coast. It was a door surrounded by bricks, just like you go to Baltimore. In New Orleans, New York, 
And when you walked in, they opened up and just bar all the way down. There's a pool table, foosball, a stage. So that's what was going on at the American Hotel. Jay Bright, you know, he's my buddy. He's taking care of me at Coca-Cola. It's like, I pay him 10 bucks. He's the main bartender, and I eat and drink all night. When I got, came out here, I did dabble in some bands up in Hollywood, and it was so much energy. So here's this buddy of mine. I haven't seen him for like, maybe now we're going on six months, and here I am drinking over at Coca-Cola's. And I got a pager, because that's how we cut the contact. And Gil's on the other line going, Stevie, you're in a band named Rommel's Goggles. You need to go to Fortress Studios in Hollywood tomorrow at 7 p.m. I'm like, Rommel, what? Well, I get up there, and this guy, wearing the exact same clothing that he's wearing right here, walks through the door of the Fortress Studios. Well, I'm this guy, and I'm very good. And I'm thinking, you know what? I came here to get signed, and I can see it right now. This is visually good. I mean, that's the band. It's a bunch of lugs. So now I'm in the band. They gave me 15 songs of this punk music. I slaved their music. They're all happy. And I said, well, there's rules to be in this band. First rule is I'm not here just to get on stage and jerk off. I'm here to get signed, become a multi-millionaire, to have a gorgeous wife and have a mansion, and go on tour and to give back what rock and roll gave me. Because rock and roll really kept me on the planet. When I was 12 years old, I was done. I hung in there. So I'm trying to explain this to these guys. They're like, Stevie, you got to be casual. And that, that became my name. And that's the name really everybody knows me by. So I decided, I was like, well, I'll move to the American Hotel. I can fart what they're asking for rent over there. And lo and behold, ladies and gentlemen, this is the apartment that I lived in in 1990, 91, all the way to 94. I was sleeping right here during the 1994 earthquake. This is a magnitude 6.6 .6 earthquake. It was centered in the northern San Fernando Valley area. They're still trying to ascertain the exact epicenter. This, this window's go all these bricks were making noise like a train. And I look up and I go, I'm special. <laughs> I can't die, I'm special. I mean, I really felt it. It lasted long. If anybody rode out to 94, it was like, this is too long. And once it goes long, it exponentially magnifies. And it's like, I'm glad, I'm blessed I haven't felt that. So now you've got Stevie Casual living in the American Hotel. Cut. Because I don't know what to talk about now. A beetle. A ringo. It's fucking obnoxious, this guy. Scene 14, take 8. Mm. Scene 14, take 9. Anyway, I just had to do that. <laughs> Take 12. Blue 32. Hey. <laughs> Scene 14, take 11. CD casual. What do you think the world would be a better place if I was a pussycat? My ex girlfriend taught me that. That was for you, Clint. I was a military brat. I never had the privilege to live in one place. When I walked in, I knew that I was gonna make this my home and all these people gonna be my family. And I did. You know, the American, you don't even have bathrooms. It's all this kind of like a dorm living. I'm living in this tiny little room. Don's got three rooms. <laughs> Don's got a kitchen. Don's got that, he's got the big old TV. I mean, VHS, this man's really got it dialed in. I've got keys to his apartment. He goes two weeks on, two weeks off. I'm the only one that has them. I don't live in this tiny little room. I live where it does. I'm a spoiled brat. I'm living the dream. I came out here to be a rock star. We all know what rock stars do. 
They do everything. <laughs> and then the rock stars before me, they died because they did everything. This is Alice Bar, which is the American Hotel building. I'm sitting here. I have a, a professional drug habit. This is 1994. Kurt Cobain has blown his head off. I have the same problem as Kurt, being the way I do my drug is the purest way. But mine was methamphetamine. I could never get more than like maybe a week or two weeks clean and I'd go back to it. What I'm thinking right here is that I have no medical in my job. I can't go to a drug rehab. So here I am thinking about, I gotta go to Montana and clean up. I'm probably 27 in that right there. Stacy's response to this is that it was just an average day in Dallas Bar. <laughs> it was just an average day. Joel Blue now. Joel Blue was a Vietnam vet. I'm a Navy brat. He was a playwright, community member. Yeah, and I guess he was just going for it. He started his business. Joel Blue met me when I first came into the community. I'm 20 years old, he's probably in his 40s. And I'm a young man, so I didn't know that really 20 years isn't really f far away. There's a good banter between us. He's so, oh, you know, you Navy brat. Casual, casual. But, but I respected Joel. He was like an authority figure to me. And he had like an authority figure in the community. He was living his dream. He's living in the community with his dogs and doing it his way. He was a, a voice of wisdom, even though you don't expect anything nice to come out of his mouth. So now we got Joel Bloom in his store. And so we go in there and he'd be B I T C H and about what they're doing in the community. I said, like, why don't you do something about it, Joel? So Joel did. He found out the workings of the world of how do you find your day in front of city council? And they changed their ways. When this man showed up, it wasn't just some angry old Vietnam vet with a handful of friends. He was an angry old Vietnam vet business person, and he was just like he was in his store. <laughs> he just started yelling at the city council, and once again, Joel Bloom, he did it. Joel Bloom gave him some direction. They made an arts district. And what's the binded all of us, the characters of downtown at that time, is that we didn't give a F-U-C-K of what you thought about us. We were trying to do our best of our ability to be who we are, and uh, he excelled at being Joel Blue. George, God, now he looks just like that now. We're dealing with the early 90s and stuff, and so a man that looks like that, it's like, that's the honeymooners to me. It's like, <laughs> he was like the unofficial custodian. He'd be like sweeping the floors at 4 a.m., 5 a.m. There's these garbage cans that are like strategically positioned in the hall. It's a common area. So we would throw our garbage there. I actually found out that he would go through our stuff. And I remember I had a lot of paraphernalia going through the garbage. <laughs> he, he stayed clear to me. But there was like mysteries that he had like money like stashed in his bed or the walls of the American. And you know, we're dealing with the 90s. And this man might have been in our building for 20 or 30 years. And he was kind of a big man. And if he ever got crazy on me, so I didn't get close to him, I never talked to him. So he was a mystery to me. The American, she's old. She's got these old bricks. She's a landmark. Well, obviously, Joel Bloom's store was in the American Hotel building. Al's bar being a nucleus of where we hung out for camaraderie among souls. Let's talk about Slash. I just read his biography. He considers his first paid gig as a professional, I think he was 16, underage, because he got a beer. It was Al's Bar. When I would go in to Al's Bar, everybody from the East Coast, CBGB's, you know, I've never been there. Anyway, uh, and so, uh, I came here in 1987. People walked around with guns. Richard Gottfried, one of our famed artists, lived off of Goliath the Seventh, carried it on his hip. It was like Batman, the first Batman. Gotham City, dark. Everybody's corrupt, and there's nobody there. That was downtown LA. This is a world-class city, but it was still wild. Today, 2014, they're selling their city, and they've been doing it since really after the riots. <laughs> and that's what LA is all about now. It's all about celebrating life and their shows. We have tour buses now that get collected up at Hollywood Highland. These people come all around the world. And there's a guy in a speaker that walks right by the American This is a merry hotel. We're being recognized about how we authentically live our lives. Come on down because it's preserved. Anyway, it's completely different.
<laughs> the generation that we created is what, what people are coming here. All the kids, when I say kids, I mean 20 year olds, they all come here and live their dreams. For the arts community, it's what you make it, and really when you show up, you're it. And you're it. And it's alive. And so I'm actually one of the people you meet. Stevie Casual. Think about the American, I'll leave it at this. This is where dreams come true, and you feel it. So now we're friends, you know who I am. Thanks for listening, and we're back. The dream!